Okay, uh, coming to you again from my living room and uh, had a few technical difficulties today. Uh, but now I'm using this microphone, so we're, we're working the bugs out of this. We're kind of learning as we go. All right, today I wanted to talk about peace, not fear. And this is based on Psalms chapter 42. And if you want to be turning to that, uh, but while you're doing that, uh, give you a little background here. I think that uh, if you're listening to the news at all, you may be detecting that there's a lot of fear out there right now. And there's a difference between fear and concern. The Bible tells us to fear not, but we do need to be concerned, especially in these tough times right now with the coronavirus. And it reminded me of back when our oldest son was in middle school. He went to uh, Talmadge Middle School here, and uh, he went out for the wrestling team. Now, I didn't encourage him to do that. He was he'd actually been playing basketball, but he wanted to go out for the wrestling team. And so the very first day of wrestling practice, he got matched up with a kid that was about a year older than he was, a little bigger than he was, a little stronger than he was. And it didn't take too long before that kid slammed him down on the mat. And John, our son, went to fall and, and he tried to brace himself with his hand and, and he broke his wrist. Just broke it. And he was in excruciating pain. Called 911 and the ambulance came and took him to the hospital. Well, I heard about it. And uh, as fast as I could, got over to the hospital, found our son and tried to console him, and then the doctor came in, and they took some x-rays, and he came back and announced, well, the wrist is broken, and we're going to have to reset it. And I said, well, what does that involve? And so he kind of explained it, and uh, so then he said, we're going to, I'm going to need to take John into this room, and so he and John went into the room. Well, I was following behind, and I was just about to go in the room as well when the doctor said, oh, you're not allowed in here. And I said, well, why not? He's, he's my son. Um, he said, well, we're going to do a procedure now that's going to cause a lot of pain, and it's probably best that you're not in here. And so he wouldn't let me go in. And I really didn't understand that at the time, but he explained that it was probably for John's best benefit. It was for the doctor's best benefit, and ultimately it was for my best benefit that I didn't have to see that and witness that situation. So I was a little confused about that. I was, and it's kind of like where we're at right now with this coronavirus. We, I don't understand exactly why we don't, we're not able to get together and, and uh, do things as normal. But I trust in what the doctors say. I trust in what our president says and our governor. And so this idea of social distancing, it's foreign to all of us, but it's the best thing to do for now. Anyway, point number one today, under peace, not fear, we want to have peace, and that is, as Christians, normally, we are encouraged to gather together. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So normally we encourage each other to get together on Sundays as we worship the Lord, praise him and get taught from his word. But right now we're in a situation where we're not able to do that. The best thing to do is actually to social distance, to stay apart. And that way, that's one of the weapons that we have, one of the only weapons we have against the virus at this point. Now, to get into Psalm 42, uh, it's a Psalm of David, and he says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the loving God. And when shall I come and appear before God? Now, this is David, a little background here. This is when he was in exile. He had to temporarily leave Jerusalem, get out of town, because there was someone that was trying to usurp his, his kingship. It was actually his son, Absalom. And so the advisors told David, you got to get out of town. 
he's got an army, we're not ready, we need to buy some time. And so David sort of went into quarantine, sort of went into what you might say social distancing like we are in order to buy some time. And so as he was doing this, as he was away from the palace, as he was away from the tabernacle, he began to get a, a little depressed and he, and he wanted to know, when can I go back and when am, are we going to be able to join together again and worship? Now it goes on to say in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? And what we're hearing right now in some of the news reports is that a lot of people are experiencing uh, a depression. They're, they're sad. They're, they're going through a time of they've been laid off or they've been sequestered at home. We're not used to that. We get bored. There's nothing to do. We feel like we should be doing something, but we can't. And so uh, a lot of people have experienced depression during this time. And I think David was experiencing a little bit of that himself when he said, my tears are, are uh, evident. And, uh, and people were saying, where's your God in all this? Now, I don't know that anybody's saying that yet, but maybe people are thinking, hey, here's this big disease that, that we have no, uh, no weapons against. And where's God in all this? Why doesn't he just uh, heal this? Why did he allow this? And these questions kind of wear at us and we can get depressed if, if we're not careful. Well, David goes on to say in verse 4, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise and with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. And isn't that so much like what we when we worship together and we get together and, and we even have, you know, times of potluck or uh, snacks afterwards or Friday night dinners. You know, I miss those times and I think you do as well. And that was true with David. And then he finishes up by saying, why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And what he was saying there is that, yeah, I'm downcast right now, but you know what? This will pass, and I'm looking forward to the day when we get together again and praise the Lord and worship him together. So uh, anyway, that's the background of this. And David, you know, he was a mighty warrior. And when he was there in, in exile, uh, he said, well, I'll go, I'll, we'll fight this, this guy and I'll go out there and fight with you. And his advisors said, David, you know what? The best thing for you to do right now is stay put, stay at home. Let us go out, fight the battle. You stay home because... Your son, Absalom, and his army are looking for you in battle. And if they find you and kill you, we are done. And so you need to stay here, stay put. You're the most important, and then we'll go out and fight the battle. And, you know, that must have been a little disconcerting to David because he was a great warrior. He was really good at, at fighting battles. He had, he had defeated the giant, for goodness sakes, and other battles as well. And, and he was being asked to stay home. And that's kind of what we're being asked to do as well. Even though we'd like to be out there doing something to fight this, the best thing we can do right now is to stay at home. All right. Point number two is that as Christians, we have the peace that passes all understanding. Now, this is a peace that even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of disease, and when everyone else is, is saying, woe is me, we can have that peace that no one really understands if you're not a Christian. And it's described in Philippians chapter 4, which says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. This is the promise that comes after prayer and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so this is the peace that we have as Christians that the world doesn't understand. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. 
My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, but my peace I give to you. Now, this was illustrated to me in a great way about nine months ago when, as most of you know, Sean Davis in our congregation, he was in a horrible motorcycle accident. He was on his way home from work and uh, took a spill on the motorcycle and ran into some things and actually was in minutes of losing his life, was in minutes of bleeding out. And fortunately, someone uh, heard his radio and, and got there immediately and, and got help, 911, and the ambulance came. And anyway, later that day, that was on a Sunday afternoon, and later that day, I heard about it. I thought, you know, I got to get over to the hospital and see how he's doing because he's probably freaking out and his family as well. And so I need to get over there and comfort them. And so I took, went over to the Salem Hospital and found his room. And there was Sean. He was laying in the hospital bed. And he had this great peace. I mean, just the, the look of of you know, I know the Lord has this. And I, and I started asking him questions about it. And Marie was there and some of his family. And, and so they were kind of filling me in on the details. But I was so amazed at just the calmness that Sean had. And now I know he might have been under some medication or maybe some drugs, but that wasn't what it was. He was very alert and he just had the confidence that God was going to get him through, that he was going to do whatever it took to get through this thing, no matter how long it took. And, and I was just amazed at that piece. And I've shared that with him a couple times and wanted to share that with you today because that is the peace that passes all understanding that we have as believers in Christ. And in this epidemic that we're in right now, that's what you and I are being, are need to show to the rest of the world is that we're not in a panic. We're not uh, just, wow, what are we going to do now? We have the peace that God is going to get through, through us. Uh, we're going to get this through, through us, through God. And, and we have that peace. All right. Now, how do we get there? By prayer. Number three, crank up your prayer life. And what I specifically am asking you to pray for with me is that we pray for protection. We pray for wisdom in this thing. We obviously are going to pray for healing for those that have, got, have the virus. And finally, we want to pray for God's intervention, that he would just step in and take care of this thing. And I got a few verses out of James chapter 5 that uh, speak to this, this thing about prayer. And James 5.13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, are we suffering as a country, as, worldwide? People are in suffering because of this. What should we do? James says we need to pray. Verse 15, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, the key there is the prayer of faith. And that is that we need to believe that God has the power, that he's in the business of healing the sick today. And we believe that. As you read God's word, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was healing people in the New Testament. He heals people today. He's bigger than the coronavirus. And we need to claim that in faith. And then in verse 16, it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And we need to be sure that we're living a righteous life through the power of the Lord. And as we do, our prayers become effective and we see people healed. All right, we're going to talk about that a little bit more here. Uh, first of all, protection. All right, the prayer of protection. And in the Old Testament, there was a prophet named Hosea. And God told him, I want you to marry this certain woman. Her name was Gomer, and uh, she was not a godly person. In fact, the Bible tells us she was a prostitute. But God commanded Hosea to, to marry her. And she, even after marriage, did not make very wise decisions. 
And so Hosea prayed a prayer of protection. He prayed actually a hedge around her that God would protect her. He called it a hedge of thorns, that she would be protected from outside forces that were trying to influence her. And certainly we can pray that prayer of protection around our loved ones concerning this coronavirus. Um, powerful prayer that we can use there, the, the hedge. And then wisdom. We want to pray for wisdom, not just for ourselves and our loved ones, but certainly for the doctors, for the nurses, for those who are on the front lines fighting this virus, and for the, the scientists, the researchers that are developing vaccines and cures uh, and medications, all these things, they all work together. Even those that are, are involved in uh, manufacturing ventilators, uh, the apparatus that, that help people breathe. We, we have a great shortage of those and, and even masks. And, and I know some of you are even making these, these masks at home so that uh, this disease will not spread. So we need to pray for wisdom and certainly for healing. We already talked about that. God is in the business of healing. And then intervention. And as you read through the Old Testament, you'll see there were various plagues that would come along. And when God's people prayed, though that God would intervene. In fact, uh, there's a verse in uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So God has a formula here, a prerequisite, and we need to take advantage of this weapon that we have against the virus and that, that God will heal not only our land, but actually all the world. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed Mike Pence, the vice president, who's been put in charge, really, of, of assembling a team to fight this virus. And if you listen to his speeches, uh, I noticed a few times at the end of his speech, he will reference this verse. And, and he doesn't quote it exactly, but he does make reference to the fact that our land will be healed. And hes I know he's a, a devout Christian, and he's referencing 2 Chronicles 7.14. All right, number four, this virus is forcing us to do some things in a different, more creative way, and it's forcing us to do them now rather than later. And this was true in Jesus' ministry, believe it or not, that he kind of got forced into getting his ministry started and it's told to us in John chapter 2 where he went to a wedding in Cana and he really hadn't done any miracles yet publicly, but here's what happened. It says, now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And so here was a situation where Jesus really wasn't ready to begin his ministry. He was saying, my hour has not yet come. But there was, there was a problem. There was a big problem. They were out of wine. And I don't know if they invited too many guests or if somebody crashed the party or somebody drank too much, but they were out of wine and they needed more. And so uh, his mother says, Jesus, you need to take care of this. You've got a problem here to, to solve. He said, it's not yet my time. But what did he do? He went ahead and solved the problem. And that's what we're in right now. We're in a, we've got a big problem. And it's forcing us to do some things we wouldn't normally do. One of them is what you're looking at right now. Now, we've, for many years, we've thought about starting a kind of an online ministry and having some things on video. And, but we drug our feet. We just, you know, we didn't have the technology. We, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, but now we have to. 
And so this is forcing us to get going with, with an online ministry. And I believe that it will pay big dividends because now this is something that uh, you can share with your friends. You can share with your loved ones if you want to. You can watch it yourself. You can look at old back and forth over and over. Or you can even turn it off. <laughs> One fellow said, I really enjoyed your video because I was able to turn it off. But of course, that's a joke. But uh, anyway. Uh, Moving on here with number five, stop listening to the negative talk. And I was listening to one of the news channels yesterday, and somebody said this, uh, and you know how bad things are in Italy right now, much worse than they are here in the United States. Uh, and here, here's the difference. In the United States, for every hundred people that, that contact the disease that, that test positive, we only have about one and a half percent that actually then go on to die from the disease. Now, you know, even one and a half percent, nobody wants that, but it's fairly low when you compare with the rest of the countries. Now, Italy, on the other hand, for every hundred people that test positive, they have 11 or 12 that pass away. So much higher death rate than we have here. But here's what I heard on the news the other day. Somebody was saying, we're looking at the numbers, and when we compare the numbers, it looks like we're about 13 or 14 days behind Italy. And wow, for a minute there, I was like panicked. Are you kidding me that we're going to have hundreds, or, or even now with Italy, it's like a 1,000 people die every day. And I thought, I can't imagine that. But you know what? As I began to think about that, I thought, I don't think so. Because here's what, what's going on with the U.S. now. With this social distancing, you've all seen the curve, the, the chart, that we're trying to, to flatten out the curve. And we're trying to delay the peak as long as we can. Because there, there's a line there where our, our hospitals get overwhelmed. And that's what we don't want to happen. That's what's happened in Italy. They have long passed the point where their hospitals are overwhelmed and they don't have enough equip equipment to service the people that are there. Uh, one of the key pieces of equipment is, is a ventilator. And what a ventilator does is it helps you breathe. And you know, the coronavirus can attack your, your lungs, your ability to breathe. And if you don't have a ventilator, if you're not in a hospital that has one, then you you got to tough it off out on your own. And piece of, pe people sometimes die because of that, because they don't have a ventilator. Well, in the U.S., we've been able to, we haven't overwhelmed our hospitals yet. Now, maybe New York, they're getting close, or, or maybe you've even crossed that line. But the more that we can defer this thing, then the safer we're going to be and the more equipment we're going to have. And, and every day that we can delay this thing, it gives us more time to catch up and, and uh, well, in the case of ventilators, be able to make more and, and have enough. So anyway, there's a fear there and uh, th that the news is having. And I would say this, if you're watching the news 16 hours a day, all of your waking hours, you're watching it too much. Because of what we know is that news, not only do they report the news to us, but also they uh, try to attract viewers. And they sell advertising. And the more viewers that they can attract, the more they can charge for advertising. And we all know that as human beings, we are attracted to bad news or fantastic news or some weird thing. And so somebody might say something that isn't exactly true, and we have to be careful with that, that, that we don't tune into that. All right, so, uh, and, and this thing could go on for weeks, months, I don't know. Nobody knows right now. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that, but one pastor, his father was getting elderly, and uh, so he, he asked him, he said, Dad, I, I want to know this before you pass away. But he said, what is your, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? And his father thought for a minute, and he said, oh, well, I, I know what it is. He said, um, and it came to pass, and, and then the pastor said, yeah, and, and what was the rest of it? 
And the father said, no, that's it. And it came to pass. <laughs> and this thing that we're going through right now, it will pass. And, and the father had been around enough that he knew that all these things that come our way, eventually they, they come to pass. They, they go away. Now, to illustrate that, think about smallpox. We've all heard about smallpox. Fortunately, we have not had to deal with it. Uh, but in the 1700s, smallpox was so rampant and so deadly that every year, just in Europe, 400,000 people died of smallpox. And that went on for 100 years. Uh, and if you multiply that out, that's 40 million people that died of smallpox. And then in the 1800s, it didn't get any better. It, it was just rampant, and it was worldwide. And there was no cure for it. Um, they didn't have the science that we have today and the research and the people and the equipment to, to do these things. And so people were just at the mercy of the disease and it affected a lot of people. But in 1980, the World Health Organization announced that smallpox as a disease had been wiped out of the face of the earth and is no longer here. And we attribute that to research and, and drugs and vaccines that, that came along as science developed and, and we learn more and more. And eventually that's the same thing that will happen with the coronavirus. We're already working on, on cures, on vaccines. Uh, the latest thing I heard was that uh, they're, they're thinking about taking the blood of people that have already had the disease, that have gotten through it, gotten over it, uh, taking their blood and then injecting it into people that are, that are testing positive. And it's not going to cure it, but the hope is that it will relieve the symptoms and make it easier to get through. So uh, all these things we praise God for and, uh, and we look forward to it. All right. So this too shall pass. Um, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to get through it? Our best weapon right now is this social distancing and prayer. Don't forget prayer. Uh, but as far as hands-on things, the social distancing, I talked about ventilators and uh, how those are being ramped up. I guess Ford Motor Company, uh, even Tesla has thought about, uh, they're, they're planning to produce ventilators uh, to get us through this thing. And, and soon we'll have more than we need here. We'll be able to give them to other countries as well. Uh, but what about financially? Um, a lot of people are, are up in arms and, and depressed and maybe even panicked about finances because you've been laid off your job um, or your business has shut down or um, the economy has just came to a screeching halt. Maybe you've lost money in the stock market and just a number of things that would cause a normal person to stress out financially during this tough time. Well, uh, there's a thing now that, as you realize, as of Friday, Congress passed a, a relief act, um, uh, a stimulus package, you might say. And part of that is, a, a, just one part of it is called the CARE Act, C-A-R-E. And it's actually designed for small businesses, nonprofits, and, and churches, even like our little church. Uh, and I looked at a video that the Solomon Fund sent out to me yesterday, and I did a few calculations roughly, and to my best estimation, we, New Life Ministries, would qualify for a $12,000 forgivable loan. And you say, wait a minute, loan? Yeah, but it's forgivable, but what do we have to do to have it forgiven? Here's what we have to do. We have to keep our staff, our paid staff, on staff and and pay them for the next three months and if we do that then 95 percent of the loan is forgiven the other five percent which in this case would amount to about six hundred dollars is payable over the next 10 years so wow uh, now our leaders and elders are going to be talking about that to see if we want to apply for that but just that I, I say that to give you an illustration that our government is willing to step in and they are committed to getting us 
through these tough times without our economy just collapsing. And you've all heard about the $1,200 for every man and woman uh, that makes under 75,000 or as a couple makes less than, did I say over, less than 75,000 or less than 150,000 for a couple, then we qualify for $1,200 and even children, uh, $500 a piece. So um, they're one of the small businesses that you may have heard of in the news is McMinimans. You, you're all familiar with their restaurants. And a couple weeks ago, when this thing first broke and they were told to shut down, they laid off all their employees. And they did it so that their employees could file for unemployment and get some relief that way. Well, as soon as this was announced on Friday, McMinimans came out with an announcement. They are hiring back all their employees and they're paying them their, their wage, the same wage they'd been getting, even though they won't be working until they're allowed to open up the restaurant again. But, and why are they doing it? Because they qualify for this same loan. They'll, they'll be able to get a forgivable loan where they can pay their employees their, their normal wage and, and they'll get this forgivable loan. It will all be forgiven. So all this to say that this too will pass and we look forward to that day. But right now, you know, I, I saw a thing one time that said, in order to get from where you were to where you want to be, you have to go through what is. And that's what we're going through right now. And so in conclusion, we just want to have a word of prayer. And in this prayer, I, I want to incorporate protection and wisdom, healing, and intervention and let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for protection, that you would build a hedge around each one in our congregation, each one in our church, and their loved ones, their families. And we just pray that you would protect us from the dis disease and, and people in our state, in our land, all over our country, all over the world, Lord, that you would protect us from this devastating d disease and Lord, we also ask you for wisdom for our doctors, for, for the research people that are coming up with a cure and vaccines and more tools that we can use against this. We just pray you'd give them wisdom and, and knowledge and understanding uh, that this would happen quickly. And Father, we pray for those that have tested positive that you would provide your supernatural healing in their lives. Lord, we, we understand that you are a God that heals. We believe it and we claim it, Father. And also, ultimately, Lord, we would ask you to step in and intervene. And we do that, that you would stop this virus. And we do it on the basis of your word that says, if your people who are called by your name will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven and you will forgive our sin and you will heal our land. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.